Hello there and welcome to Leveling Up Education. We are here in Barcelona in a Starbucks and this is actually one of the cooler places that uh, I've been so far and we have Marie here as a guest who is a trainer for teachers and we've been working together for the last week and I thought there were like so many conversations that I thought we could go much deeper into so that's kind of what we're doing here and before we start Marie why don't you introduce yourself and like where you're coming from what's your background and how you ended up being a trainer for teachers? Well, I come from Argentina. Uh, I began my career working as a teacher for children. Mm. Uh, and I studied uh, to be a pedagogue. Yeah. Uh, and when I finished my, well, uh, when I finished my career as a pedagogue, I decided to, well, I became keen on children that had difficulties in learning. So I studied uh, then well, educational psychology, and then I worked for uh, seven years as an educational psychologist. And now, in the last years, I wanted to improve music because this is a uh, well one of my passions. Uh, and I came here to Barcelona to study music therapy. So, uh, well, and while being here in Barcelona, I I started working as a trainer on topics about uh, well-being, education, um, well, basically my, my topic is well-being in education. So did you start this, like, as you moved in Barcelona, or did you already work on this while you were in Argentina? Well, in Argentina, I worked uh, as a lecturer in the university for uh, students, uh, and I was teaching on psychology, uh, psychology of children, uh, and also on how to uh, evaluate uh, children with uh, special needs. I mean, in Argentina, I was, uh, yeah, I always teach. Since yeah. I begin my career, I, I am a teacher. And then I did, I did teaching in different contexts and topics. But yeah. now I'm doing this uh, teacher training, and, but I'm very happy. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity of, um, yeah, of getting deeper into this topic. Yeah, of course. Uh, so since you do have a, a good insight on how education works in Argentina, as well as now Spain and Barcelona, by observing things a little bit from a higher level on training teachers, kind of like a teacher for teachers almost, um, what would you say are the biggest differences between Argentina and Barcelona in terms of like education, the quality of that, and if there are certain things done in Argentina that you wish that would also be done in Barcelona? Hmm. I don't have much to say about this because uh, here I, I I'm not so inside that school. Gotcha. Uh, I've been working more with uh, teachers from, from all over Europe. Hmm. What I can say is uh, because I, I know teachers, uh, from here uh, and also well i've been uh, getting to know people from all over europe i can say that maybe we are all in the same boat <laughs> yeah, okay. and i think that one of the topics that most uh, worries uh, now uh, is um, one of them is motivation of the students uh, relationship and i think that now we have a, a new pandemic of, uh, of mental health problems, um, depression, anxiety, especially after pandemic. Uh, so well, this is also one of the topics that most worries to, to teachers. Yes. Yeah, I can see that like burnout amongst teachers becomes more and more common. And uh, as responsibilities as te with teachers kind of increase, it is much harder to like motivate the students in a meaningful way so when students are not motivated the job as a teacher just becomes so much harder because not only like you almost have to fight in order to do your job and uh especially if you're not taught how to do this properly and in germany we for example have this problem that due to the lack of teachers we start hiring people that do not have a pedagogical yeah. background yeah. and especially those people seem to be unprepared for the challenges of working with like um, younger children or even teens because it's just a different world that they grow up in with the technology nowadays and as you said like anxiety like these depressions are at an all-time high and we are still recovering from this pandemic of covid but i don't think we we've truly overcome it because people still feel isolated people still feel like they don't really have a way a positive future ahead of them. So 
if you talk with teachers that seem to be in a bad place and they are a little bit frustrated or overwhelmed with the whole situation, like how would you approach them and kind of um, show them the light that there is? <laughs> Well, um, I think I always say the same uh, to the teacher that I think um, today is a challenging world, but in classrooms we can do a lot because um, the second place more important for a children or for an adolescent is school. It's the place where they spend mostly most part of the day. And also nowadays children are online a lot of their time as well. And in schools we can... We have presenciality. We can uh, look into eyes of other people. We can, I don't know, relate and get friends. We can uh, work on, on our emotions, uh, learn how to get related with others. And I think these things, which are key, uh, we learn them uh, at our home first and then at school. Mm. So this is, um, I think, it, uh, we have a, a big opportunity mm. as teachers every day uh, and we don't have to get frustrated because of the difficulties and sometimes i think it's important to focus on what's important mm. uh, why am i here as a teacher and what do i want my students to take gotcha. and sometimes i don't know maybe um, the focus is on the cognitive and it is important but well, if the students on this lesson took another thing that was not the cognitive, maybe they learn values or other things, well, we are doing a good job. Uh, so sometimes uh, I think we have to um, maybe have clear what we want gotcha. and accept that things are different. Mm. Uh, some things we, we, we don't choose them, they are there and try to do our best. And I think that um, small things make big difference. Mm, okay. So what I'm hearing from you is essentially one of the more important things as a teacher is that you are in control of your emotions, that you do not get overwhelmed by the situation and uh, are aware of like where you are currently as well as like where you are, where your students are, mm. and then give them kind of like this thing to pursue. Uh, I always like to talk about it as like the the reason why we are learning something, which mm. I felt was missing in my education, that no one really told me why I was learning something. And as soon as I was given like the why, or uh, when I was working as a tutor, I also started always with, you don't learn math to understand, like memorize the formulas. Mm. It is to solve problems later on. And, it's not necessarily this specific problem, but it's more about teaching you a way of thinking. And by kind of giving students a reason why they should pay attention, a reason why this information is important, I think it also increases their motivation and makes the job as the teacher much easier because the students stop questioning every like, lecture or lesson, asking themselves, is this really relevant? Like, will I need this in the future? why am i learning this and if we get past this i think we can have a much higher quality teaching and help our students ultimately be prepared for the future yeah i think meaning is very important i mean when you have meaning you have motivation and when you don't know why you're doing what you're doing uh, it's easier that you lose the students on the way so showing the value behind the task um, I think it's very important uh, enrolling them, engaging, mm. uh, and this we ha but we have to be convinced why we teach what we teach. Of course. And um, well, yes, some some topics maybe you don't know when you are going to implement them, but you are working on your cognitive skills. Mm. So uh, yes, and I think that we as teacher we have the first responsibility to say, hey, look, what I'm teaching yeah. to you uh, is. It's meaningful and mm. you're learning this and um, if they don't know why it's for yes you you have less, less chances of uh, getting them engaged yeah, yeah i can see that uh, so i'd like to focus a little bit more on um, regulating your own nervous system as a teacher because ultimately it's one of the more um it can be one of the more stressful situations to be in in a room full of like teenagers that are all kind of just getting to know the world and uh, their place in it. 
So uh, you also have a background as a mindfulness teacher. Mm. Uh, so what would you tell teachers to kind of like calm themselves and uh, remain in control in these stressful situations? For the students or for the teachers? Firstly, for the teachers, because mm. I think as a teacher, you first need to be the one mm. that is calm and then you can kind of guide your, your yeah, students yeah, yeah. along the way, right? Well, I think that teaching uh, as any human job is uh, you have lots of stress. Um, and when you are taking care of people, when you have a responsibility on, on, yeah, on looking after people, you have uh, more chances of getting stressed uh, because you're all the time thinking in, in others and, and lots of things happen at the same time. So I think that stress is something uh, maybe when we study to be teachers, we are not trained yeah. in this. Um, and well, for me personally, uh, for example, practicing mindfulness was a great tool because it helped me to become aware, to say, okay, how am I now today? And to self-regulate your emotions better. Um, and this is very important because mm. uh, we have an impact on others. It's not the same uh, how you say things, how you approach the students, uh, how you speak to the students. Uh, and so you have, when you have awareness of, okay, now I'm stressed, uh, how, am I standing, how am I standing, how, how, how is my tone of voice, uh, then you can change little yeah. things for the others and for yourself. Yes. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very cheap tool. <laughs> I like the word. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't have to buy nothing you have yeah. to just concentrate on, on your breathing and and try to put the mind in the present moment and i think this also helps to to prioritize to say okay what's important because we can't do everything at the same time and it's very common that we as teachers we are all the time um, multitasking mm. this is a great source of stress yeah. so sometimes it's good to say okay and uh, one of the things you learn with mindfulness is to live um, slow and to choose, to yeah. take decisions, what is important in this moment. And sometimes we want to have it all. We want to, the students to learn, to be happy, to be concentrated, motivating, raising their hands. And maybe you say, okay, today is not a good day. Today my focus is uh, get to the end of the class and try to do my best. Okay. And I think this helps a lot because, um, yeah, you, you begin to learn to, to be more present mm. and to, to listen to what is really happening in that mm. moment. And I think teaching in that sense is an art yes. because um, you have the theory, you have the knowledge, but then a classroom is a piece of art because mm. you have to um, manage the emotions, your own emotions, the emotions of others. Uh, guide people, guide your students so that they can see what you want to show them. So, um, being present and being um, a having a flexible mind yeah. that you can adapt. So you say, okay, now I have a student that is feeling is not feeling well. Yeah. Well, I can stop and change what was in my mind and do something different, recreate the situation. Yeah. And I think this is um, this is like an artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I really like how you put it because if we look at it from this perspective, then it is like very obvious that the, the role as a teacher can never be replaced by mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. Yeah. But um, AI could like help us in that way. But ultimately, you still have to kind of be aware on the emotions that you are currently feeling as well as your students. And that's the unique part of being human that we are able to read each other's emotions, tend to like regulate them, and the AI will not be able to do that anytime soon. And I think this is where the teachers need to step in and like not only empower the students in like what they learn, but also how they can like regulate themselves, self soothe, uh, kind of adjust and really focus on the things that they can control. And this is just not something that you can learn from, from a computer or from, no. from AI. This is this human interaction that is, uh, you, you said it's cheap, but I think I agree with you, like everyone can do it. 
but it's so valuable. It may even be the most valuable thing that you can provide as a teacher for your students to be emotionally present for them and kind of um, open up the space so they can be themselves and kind of express themselves and maybe they have a bad day and it's okay to have a bad day, right? Like there's nothing like wrong with that and everyone has these. And like in these situations, it's important to really, yeah, allow them to feel that, but also know that there is someone that is like there for them and uh, ready to support in any way. Yeah, yeah, and also we are uh, as as teachers, the students are looking at us yeah. all the time, and they learn more from what they see rather than what we say. We can say yes, you have to learn to be uh, self-regulated, but if we don't regulate ourselves. Uh, Students, they smell when you are yeah. inconsistent. Yeah, we, we need to be a role model in a way that, like, what we, we need to do the talk. Like, we cannot just preach about something. Like, we also need to embody it ourselves. Because otherwise, as you said, it's, like, just empty words. So, in terms of, like, uh, kind of regulating your emotion and um, being in control of that, mm -hmm. uh, you also are starting to go deeper in the whole music therapy. And I think... <laughs> Music is one of the ways that um, allows me, for example, to express my emotions at a much deeper level than I could ever do because uh, a song or music or a rhythm has so much more nuances that can like explain my, my situation in a way. And sometimes like, yes, like this song gets me somehow. Mm. So uh, how did you get started with the whole music therapy and how do you see the connection there with emotions? Well, um, first I went to music therapy because I wanted to help um, the students I have uh, that have special needs. And I realized that music was very powerful. I started um, with my drums uh, in yeah working and I saw that if they had a big impact. And as I, as I always been a musician, uh, for a hobby, um, as a hobby, I mean, I always did music. Um, I say, okay, I will study music therapy. And while doing um, the master, I realized that um, yeah, music is really powerful, and we <laughs> are not giving the space that music should have at school. Um, and with music, you work lots of emotional things. For example, uh, well, music is done to express emotions actually. Mm. Uh, to it's a language itself. Yeah. So uh, some there are many things that you can't express verbally, but non-verbally you express it through music. Yeah. So this what you were saying that uh, sometimes you know you, you listen to a song and you say, oh, this reflects how I'm feeling, or it makes you cry, or it makes mm. you smile, or remember something. Uh, so every time we put music, we ah. are moving emotions. Uh, and when we do music in group, uh, we are working something that is uh, very primitive. That is this idea of working uh, in a circle. Oh, yes. Um, and well, great things happen <laughs> when when you work like this in a circle. I mean, you work uh, synchronicity. Mm. And we humans, we have this capacity of being synchronized with other. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you put a tempo in a group we will all start to be synchronized with the tempo. Mm. Um, and this creates uh, a cohesion in yeah. the group. And well, there is also biological synchronicity. For example, mm. many people, they, they, their hearts, they are beating at the same time. Uh, and the same happens with uh, music. When mm. you put music, um, after a while, you will start feeling and moving to that uh, yeah. emotion. So, um, yeah, music is absolutely powerful. I can see that. And, and I think um, this is, is, for example, something artificial intelligence will not replace. I mean, mm. we can do, uh, machines can do yeah. music, but the fact of being together as a group, yes. playing yeah. instrument and expressing um, emotions and be, becoming creative, uh, this is something that you have to live it. Yeah. You, yeah. The machine I, will, yeah. will not replay. I, I like the, the word you use, synchronicity. And mm. I think this, this puts it so nicely, since it's almost as music allows us to, to live in this shared reality, because everyone is kind of in their own heads, doing their own thing. But 
when there's music, this is something that we all like listen to and mm. everyone hears it and it kind of influences all mm. towards that different state of mind almost. Mm. And we can be more in tune with that. And um, yeah, again, it's, it's more closely connected. Like, okay, we live in the same world. We have these same sensations and experiences around us. And I think this may be the reason where we, we kind of sync up and be in tune and um i think uh the it's very powerful since like our ancestors started with like these tribal fires and like played music around this and this is just something that truly connects us um i think if you combine music with stories for example uh this is like the ultimate way to just get people to to work together to do things to collaborate to just be this almost one unit uh, mm. kind of like all working together and uh, i i also kind of like to use music to to get me in different in these different states for example i have a playlist specifically for when i'm studying or working on mm. something and it kind of helps me go into that so i think to a certain degree this is just um just habitual training like oh okay i start the playlist i get working my body knows what's about to happen but also since the music is kind of like calming me and it um it depends on what kind of music of course. uh the music that i listen to seems to occupy this this monkey mind of mine mm. so like this is taken care of and then i can be like my true self and focus on the thing in front of me without being distracted by all of these other things because this monkey mind is like happily listening to the music mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah, well, um, most, uh, songs uh, are part of our identity. And this is why it's so important to, to, yes, to listen to music and to have a connection every day uh, with music. Because uh, if you see your life, uh, you will always find uh, some song that represented some moment mm. or that reflected one feeling. Or like you said, this music helps me concentrate. It helps me to shut the monkey mind, or some music can help you activate and feel better with your body. Uh, so yes, uh, music um, brings emotion and expresses emotion. And um, well, uh, I have worked with older adults and elder adults, and it's amazing. I I've seen miracles there. Really, I mean, I I'm really surprised, and I'm willing to continue uh, studying in this area, but. Uh, when you put a music that is relevant emotionally, uh, people start activating and feeling well. And this brings lots of uh, positive emotions and, and sensations. And so it, for me, it's an amazing tool. And, and also working, for example, in the classroom with the music that the students bring. Oh, uh, you I work also it, yeah. the emotions. I mean, why do you like this music? Mm. What makes you feel? What makes you remember? Uh, it is uh, directly connected with mm. your experiences. Also, kind of being aware of what kind of music to listen to, I think, is quite important because, um, like, music isn't just rhythm and like the beat, but also the lyrics. And even mm. though we may not actively listen to the lyrics, like they still enter our subconscious mind to a certain degree. And if the lyrics tend to be more destructive and uh, kind of repeat a message that may not be as empowering, this could further um, solidify this limiting belief of someone maybe not feeling good enough because the music kind of tends to point them in that direction and being aware of like where this may come from and um, a simple shift on saying, okay, well, you listen a lot to this music, but you also don't feel like empowered or happy or excited about life. If you were to change the music that you listen to, maybe you can move towards a, a life that you tend to prefer over the other one where you, you feel like you're going in a positive direction. And um, also like generally being respectful towards other human beings is also something part of music. Uh, uh, I would actually go like to go a little bit deeper in how music can like actually enhance your performance to a certain degree. For example, in physicality, like sports, I think uh, I read that music can have a boost of fifteen percent um, for like uh, someone 
performing a personal record. So they're much more likely to do that while listening to music that tends to hype them up. And same thing when like I was studying, I listened to the specific music. It feels like I'm more creative. And I also know that you work more with creativity. So um, can you talk a little bit about the, the role of music in creativity and like how um, generally, I think creativity is like a topic that we can dive a little bit deeper in as well. Yeah, well, um, when you do music, you are working uh, lots of parts of the brain together. And one of the things is that you work the left and the right side of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are, on one hand, you are uh, music pathologic, has a tempo, has a structure. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, you are expressing your emotions, you are um, uh, get, letting yourself to be free. For example, if you're improvising, you, are, um, you let yourself go with the flow and see what comes. Uh, you are dealing with the unexpected as well. Uh, so when you, when you do music, depending on how, I mean, depending what you're doing with the music, but for example, if you, are, uh, if you pick an instrument and you say, okay, I will... Uh, start to practice and to see what happens and I will see what melody comes from this. In an improvisation, for example, you get totally creative. And when you do improvisation in a group, uh, you never know what is going to come. Yeah. And you can begin with one sound and this sound then can begin into something else. And you can begin happy with a, you know, with a song that is in a, in a major mode and then you go into another mode. Uh, and this has to do with being in, in flow as mm. well, with, with stages of, of flow, of being creative, of being totally absorbed by yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, I love that when uh, the way you described as you start with like a certain melody or like maybe a certain task and you keep going and you end up at a place that you never would have imagined to be um, maybe emotional. It's like, oh, wow, like this got like sad in the end. Maybe there is something like in me that I need to resolve. Hmm. or maybe as well as like oh look there's like this this new insight that like came through this collaborative work seeing like oh we actually don't have to go through the wall we can go around it um and like this seems to happen in, in this flow state but um maybe not uh, everyone is familiar with this flow state where we tend to feel our best and perform our best uh, can you um dive a little bit deeper in this flow state well, this is a, a concept uh, of positive psychology uh, and it's related with moments where you're totally immersed in an experience, totally in bulk. Uh, and these states are uh, related with um, happy emotions, with uh, pleasant emotions. And usually uh, people associate uh, happiness with moments of where they are totally engaged with something. Uh, and well, creativity uh, that is related with flow moments. When mm. people do a creative task, uh, you get easily in the flow. Why? Because you get rewarding. You get feedback immediately from what you're doing. So I know if I am playing music and it, it has a nice sound to me, this is immediate feedback. I get, mm. um, I, I like it and I want to continue with this sound. I want to explore another sound and I, I the activity itself gives you uh, a self-reward. So you can be maybe doing music two hours and then you say, oh, two hours have passed. <laughs> and then you say, yes, two hours have passed. You were totally involved mm. in what you were doing. Yeah. And I think this is something that uh, we need more in like education or in the school in general. Mm. But um, I think everyone should feel this kind of state on a regular basis where they like completely immersed in whatever they're doing, um, learning something new that they're excited about, that they, they feel like a motivation, like a purpose behind that. And um, uh, you, you mentioned like certain flow triggers, for example. So you mentioned immediate feedback, which tends to get you deeper in this flow state yeah. because you, you can adapt very quickly. And I think in school, it can be something very similar. If, if you're working on like, a problem, and, uh, someone helps you specifically like hey uh, you, you made like a logical error right there yeah. this is immediate feedback so you don't waste time pursuing an alley that may not exist because you made like a, a fallacy at the beginning 
if you can correct this very early on, you tend to be much more likely to follow this, this path where you need to go instead of just like following this wrong path where you, you make assumptions on assumptions that may not be true anymore. So this immediate feedback, I find like one of the more important things. Um, but music in general can also be a flow trigger. So you just, uh, it doesn't have to be playing music itself, but like listening to music. Um, and uh, meditation is one of the other things, being mindful. I think these are all these flow triggers and everyone has their own. For some, it may be drinking coffee. For some, maybe just like chatting with friends. And I think it's important that we, we encourage in like in both teachers and students to find out what their flow trigger is. Yeah. And for some, it may be like this specific music. For some, it may be playing video games. And for others, it may be reading a very like good fantasy book. But like all of these things kind of tend to put us in the state. And one of the most beautiful things about this, I find, is at the end of that, we don't feel depleted or drained, but we feel actually more energized. It's like, wow, yeah. that was cool. And like and I would walk. You want to do like, more. And yes. In fact, uh, when you learn, you also can get the flow very yeah. easily because when, after learning, you feel that happiness. Oh, I learned. I did it. Yeah. And I think uh, beginning again with motivation, that was the first thing we, we begin thinking. Uh, I think that we have to uh, try to go on that direction. I mean, yeah. uh, the happiness that brings learning, the yeah. fact of learning, you know, of uh, having a new ability. Um, exploring the world the curiosity mm. uh, and yes and i think we have to to manage uh, to yeah to create a flow to try to create these these moments and and also uh, manage the the flow in the classroom but in this meaning i'm, I'm really referring to emotion the emotional yes. state there is a, a kind of a flow in a classroom yeah. uh, when you begin you see how your students are you see how they are standing the position uh, the rise if they are concentrated or not so we have to try to to manage this emotion mm. um, and yes and of course that for uh, getting to the flow we need to know them yeah. what gets them in the flow uh, what are their skills where are their abilities and, and one of the conditions for the flow is the challenge yes so we need also i mean if you go to school and you know you don't have a challenge you you will not get in the flow, you will not get motivation. Yeah, and, and you mentioned something that I find extremely important because um, I'm seeing in some schools a trend where they want to make like things easier for the students, kind of allow them to just like, I don't know, learn better. And I think their intentions are very well, but sometimes if we take away the challenge, it just becomes boring. Mm. And, um, in like many think they protect the students or the children by removing this challenge mm. but i think like through the challenge we learn through the challenge we like we make mistakes but through these mistakes we learn much more by making a mistake instead of like getting it right the first time because through a mistake it's like oh okay next time i need to change this and um this is why i love games so much because they tend to be like challenging Mm. right at the point where it's not overwhelming but it's also not boring and um kind of getting in the zone and i think this is the, the definition of flow uh the sweet spot between boredom and overwhelming yeah. anxiety and like trying to make education as close as possible to that where every student is individually challenged to their abilities and interests um without having to go through this um unnecessary learning because at the moment school seems to be organized like a factory line and everyone is learning at the same pace even though everyone is so individual and everyone has these different interests that half of the class like may already know the stuff and the other half is like overwhelmed by that and as a teacher, it's very difficult to kind of get these two groups together yeah. and get into this flow, into this uh, where everyone is engaged at the same time. So I think we have a, a challenge ahead of us on kind of individualizing education there a little bit. But I think with, with AI and virtual reality, we will eventually get there. And um, to kind of wrap things up a little bit, something that I like to do in the end is uh, kind of have you describe 
the future of education, where you think the trend is going, and um, if things were going like in the ideal world, in the perfect, perfect scenario, uh, what would you wish that happens and the direction that we would head uh, towards the, a better education? Uh, I think working with emotions, with well-being, uh, also the, the cognitive aspect is important. I think we have to, to work on this curiosity that we were speaking before. Um, Yes, and I think that education is for um, developing our inner uh, abilities. So I think uh, this, yeah, education is for happiness, and <laughs> for happiness and also for our personal realization. Mm, and this has to do with, with our abilities uh, and also with our social life and emotions. So I think... Um, you know, for me, that's the, the most important part in education. Uh, if education is growing. It's, a, it's leading the person to their personal development. And this also has to do with cognition, mm -hmm. not only, I mean, emotions and cognition, both things. Mm. Nice. I like this. So the way you put it is kind of education is the path that everyone can take towards being this lifelong learner because ultimately like learning never stops and i think it's our responsibility to to set the path like kind of these are the tools that you can use and um now you have to kind of like make it in the own in, in the world right and, uh, education or like school ultimately is to prepare students for the future if we equip them with all of these tools with like knowing how they get into flow being immersed being kind of control of their emotions, understanding what kind of flow triggers they have. I think we are very well on the path towards, um, they said that education is for happiness. And yeah. this is where we're headed. Yeah, and the reality is that the students today don't know which jobs they are going yeah. to have in the future. We, we are preparing them for uncertain jobs. Yes. So I think that uh, the focus must be, yes, in the curiosity, in developing skills and developing the uh, the happiness of learning. I mean, learning is nice. <laughs> it really is, yeah. Yeah, so well. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Maria, for um, being on the podcast. It was a pleasure. Um, well, thank you yeah, for uh, inviting me. <laughs> uh, is there any way people could reach out to you if they want to know a little bit more about like uh, emotional intelligence or music therapy? Uh, where could they uh, potentially reach you? Um, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, ask Maria del Monte. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. It will be down in the description, so if you want, uh, you can check it out there. Um, okay. Otherwise, uh, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you.